All right. Wednesday night, we've been in the book of Psalms. We're in the book of Psalms 89. And if you want to find Psalms 89, I'll bring you up to speed where we was at. We touched on six different points last week. We talked about the, the title of being a covenant relationship. Covenant relationship. That's a commitment on two parties to fulfill an obligation. Number one was commitment from Ethan, the writer. We'll talk about him in a moment. Number two was commitment from God, and it was specifically directed to David and his sons. Then we saw number three, a commitment from the heavens, and that talked about the angels, the angelic leaders, and those around the throne of God where they worship him. Number four was the commitment from the earth. We talked about the power and control over the earth. Number uh, five is a commitment from all creation. And then number six was God blesses the faithful. From their favor and fellowship of God to their rejoicing, strengthening, and protection in God. Tonight we're going to start off with number seven. Roman numeral seven, if you're writing down, is God's promise of blessing. Now this is the second part of this hymn. It starts in verse 19 where we're at tonight. It is a poetic version of the prophecy given to the prophet Nathan to deliver to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. The psalmist, who's Ethan, he recounts God's remarkable intervention in the life of a common shepherd boy named David. Then Ethan dives into some specifics of God's covenant relationship with David. Keeping that in mind as we look at verse 19. This is going to be uh, uh, Ethan speaking prophetically uh, as God to the people. And it says, then you, talking about God, then you, God, spoke in a vision to your holy one, your faithful one. This is David. David is being singled out as holy to the Lord. Wouldn't you like God to look at you and say, you are holy? Well, he does, if you have Christ living inside of you. <laughs> now, God blesses David, number one, through a relationship. And we're going to see 14 of these points in the next few verses about God's blessings to David. David, God's blessed David through a relationship. That's number one. Even though his beginnings were not spectacular, it was not something uh, uh, extraordinary, as we will see in just a few moments. He was just the youngest in his family, common family, and a shepherd boy. Look at the next part of that verse. It says, Then you, uh, God, spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. This is God saying that God's blessing David with, number two, his help, God's help. God is saying, I bestow strength on a warrior. Now, I want you to think about this. David is a young boy, and God is already referring to him as a warrior. Wow. We're going to you can talk a little bit about that a little bit later as well. So, keep that in mind. Look at the next part of that verse. I have exalted one chosen from the people. Now, that word, uh, one chosen, that means election. He was elected. He was chosen is what that means, to choose. Elected from the people. When it says from the people, it's talking about the common stock of Israel. So, with that in mind, God blesses David with, number three, exaltation. Number four, election. God is saying, I have raised up a young man from among the common people to be king. He's ID as, identified as a commoner that has been exalted by God. He's not from nobility. He's not from the wealthy. He is just from the people. God found him. God chose him. God exalted him. And God called him a warrior while yet an ordinary, humble shepherd boy. Does these beginnings sound familiar to you? If you know the story of Jesus, you know his humble earthly origins, the son of a carpenter, and yet God exalted him as the Holy One, the Son of the Most High, God, came to be like a sheep led to the slaughter as the Lamb of God. But he will come again as the Lion from the tribe of Judah, as the warrior king. In verse 20, God continues speaking through Ethan the prophet, speaking through the Psalms. He says, I have found my servant David with my holy oil. I have anointed him as king. God blessed David with, number five, an anointing. More important than the crown that will eventually be on his head, 
more importantly than the protection that God gives him from his enemies, is the anointing that God put on his head. It says that God has chosen him and that God has poured out his spirit upon him. I can't help but to see a double meaning. As we talked about last week, a lot of double meanings in this uh, Psalms. And it's because David is foreshadowing Jesus. So every time I read something, I see both meanings. Here, the first meaning is David anointed to be king at a later time. Remember, he was a young boy. God anointed him, but there was a problem. Saul was still on the throne. And David was not going to take Saul off the throne. He said, no, God put him on the throne. God's going to have to take him off the throne. God wants me on the throne. He has to be at the right time. And so David bought his time until it was his time to be the leader. Jesus was anointed to be king. Several places in scripture talks about where he was anointed. His head was anointed. His feet was anointed. He was anointed and he will be king at a later time as well. Um, the title that is given to Jesus is Messiah or Christ. Both of those words mean anointed, set apart for the task at hand. In verse 21, with whom my hand shall be established. Here you go. God saying that his hand, God's hand is going to sustain David and to keep him steady. God blesses David number six with security. God will keep him safe. And then the next part of the verse 21 says, also my arm, which means my powerful arm, shall strengthen him or make him strong. God blesses David with God's own strength. That's number seven. David, uh, God blesses David with God's own strength. Verse 22, the enemies shall not outwit him. That means the enemy shall not ever have control of him, nor the sons of wickedness afflict him. No, never will he be defeated or overpowered by the wicked. God bless David with number eight, protection. Verse 23, it says, I will beat down. This is God speaking now on, on behalf of David. He said, I will beat down his foes. That means to defeat or crush his foes before his very eye, uh, face so that his eyes can see it. And he will. God says he will plague those who hate him. That means strike them down. God bless David with number nine, vindication. You know, in scripture, we often hear people quote, God says, vengeance is mine. And when God brings his vengeance, vengeance upon people, it is with severe punishment. God has told David, I've got you, David. And David would oftentimes stay back and say, okay, God, I'm following your lead. Remember, remember several times David was uh, having his life threatened by Saul. And he would go and run and hide and run and hide. But yeah, he's anointed to be the next king. And yet Saul kept trying to kill him. And he had several opportunities that he could have killed Saul. But he knew that vengeance is mine, said the Lord. David was allowing God to fulfill the scriptures, to fulfill his promise to David. Look at verse 24. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. I will always support him. I will always love him. Now here in verse 24, the first part, God blesses David with two things right off the bat. Number one, never ending faithfulness. That's number 10, actually. Uh, and, and, and as we're looking at God's blessings on David, number 10 is never ending faithfulness. Number 11 is God's loyal love. That's that word mercy. That's God's loyal love. Uh, and, and, and when you put these two together, it's talking about God's unfailing loyalty through his love for David and the support for David. Look at the last part of verse 24. It says, and in my name, very important that you pay attention to that. It says, in my name, his horn shall be exalted. And when it says horn, it's talking about his authority shall be exalted. In other words, his strength will continue to grow in power. Now, God bless David with number 12, God's authority, not David's authority. What David did as king was not in his own authority. It was God working through him, God's authority. David was never overthrown. He conquered every single enemy that rose up against him. God remained true to his word and demonstrated his love to his servant David, as well as through his son, Jesus. All these blessings that we see uh, for David can also be true of Jesus. Verse 25, 
Also, I will set my hand over the sea. That's power to rule over the sea. And his right hand over the rivers. That's his authority. Uh, God saying, I will put him in charge of the sea and he will control the rivers. Now, this is most likely a reference to Israel's expansion of its borders through David. Special note that this language that we see right here is the exact same language used in verses 9 and 10 to talk about God's control over creation. So what we it appears is that God is extending to his servant the authority over his creation. So, number 13, God blesses David, expansion of his kingdom. This is foreshadowing Jesus who came as a servant who has the authority within himself over his own creation to rule the whole earth. In verse 26, he shall cry to me or say to me or talk with me. You are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Uh, I love uh, another translation that says, you are my father, my God, my rock, and my savior. In this, we see and hear the covenant relationship between God and David. Intimate language reflecting an intimate relationship with David. But it's so much more for us. Now, listen to what God does. As my father, God provides, God protects, God guides, God is always there. As my God, God desires worship and God deserves worship. God is creator and God is sustainer. As my rock. Now, rocks are very long lasting and provide a very good picture of God's attributes. God stands secure. God will never be moved. As my Savior, God is deliverer. God is the one who rescues us. God has saved us from sin, and God has saved us for everlasting life. So our relationship with God can be so much more intimate than David's relationship with, was with God because the spirit within us is there to communicate with us, to teach us, and to comfort us. And like David was unique in the Old Testament where God's spirit came upon him and it appears dwelt within him because oftentimes he would say, Lord, don't take your spirit from me. He understood what it was like to be separated from God from sin. We also have that kind of relationship, but ours is even more intimate because we're on this side of Jesus' resurrection. We know what is in store for us. And then we get to verse 27. Also, I will make him, talking about David, my firstborn. Now, this is a unique concept because most people, when they hear firstborn, they're thinking order of birth. That is not the Hebrew way. Firstborn in Hebrew culture did not require you to be the first son born. Being firstborn was more to do with rank and privilege than order of birth. David was the youngest in his family. And yet here God says that I'm going to bless David with number 14, privilege. The blessing of the firstborn that demonstrated God's covenant relationship with David. Jesus was referred to as the firstborn. I'm going to point out four of those times that he was uh, referred to. In Colossians 1.15, he was the firstborn of all creation. In Colossians 1.18 and Revelation 1.5, Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. And in Hebrews 1.6, Jesus was the firstborn into the world. It's talking about the highest my a uh, 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 highest privilege of rank. Now look at the verse 27 again. It says, also I will make him my firstborn, the highest or the mightiest of the kings of the earth. And he was. David was the mightiest. Solomon was the wisest. But David was the mightiest. And David was the one with, that was the highest. David is the one who united the northern and the southern kingdom. God did a lot through David. Look at verse 28. My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. God says that my love will protect him forever. My commitment will, with him will never end. Now, Hebrews 13, 5 and John 14, we see that for God himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And Jesus said, I will go to prepare a place for you. That's forever. That's everlasting. That's a covenant. That's his mercy. That's his loyal love directed to us. This is more intimate language revealing the covenant relationship that we have with God as well. Look at verse 29. His seed, talking about David, his seed also I will make to endure forever. And his throne 
as the days in heaven. God says, I will make his family continue forever. His kingdom will last as long as the sky. Here is another double meaning that I see. First, it was fulfilled in, in Solomon's reign. God uh, did produce a, 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 a throne for Solomon, the seed of David. But also, it's a reference to Jesus' reign. Now, it's kind of neat because first, Jesus reigns in our heart. But secondly, uh, God working through us to reach all people so that those of us who follow Jesus, we know that in his second coming, he will rule for 1,000 years on this earth and then forevermore. So uh, Jesus is the seed of David, the son of David. Therefore, the lineage is definitely royal and God will fulfill that. So number seven in your hand, if you're doing a handout, is God's promise of blessing. Number eight is God's promise of correction. And that's what we start to see in verse 30. God's promise of correction. And it's talking about David. It's talking about his covenant relationship with David. It's talking about God's blessings on David. And now look what he says. If David's sons, that's his descendants, forsake my law. I mean, stop following my law. Now, my law is a, is a Hebrew word called Torah. It refers to the first five books of the Bible. Some scholars call it the books of Moses. Here, it's implying God's instructions as contained in God's word. So he says that if David's sons forsake my law and do not follow in my judgments, if they break my statutes, that's laws, and do not keep my commandments or ignore my commandments, then... So if they do these things, then God says, I will punish their transgression with the rod. That word rod is talking about severely. Now, he didn't say sword. If he just said sword, sword, it would have meant he would cut them off. It means that he will punish them severely. This is a tool of correction, not destruction, like the sword. The sword is for destruction. And remember, David... He was a shepherd. He understood what it was like to carry that staff, demonstrate love for his sheep. But he also knew what it was like to carry that rod to beat off, to warn off the enemy, which would have been uh, wolves. It could have been uh, bears. could have been the lions. And, and, and a shepherd had to be brave to stand up for their sheep. Jesus, we know, has that staff and he has that rod. Here, God tells David in this covenant royal language that he, God will punish his children if they disobey. And then the last part, look what it says in verse 32, the last part says, and their iniquity or their disobedience with stripes. All of David's descendants would have a part in the covenant relationship from 2 Samuel chapter 7. Either through obedience and be blessed or through disobedience and face severe punishment. God did that. When David's descendants rebelled, rejected, and left, didn't listen to, disobeyed God, then God severely punished them. Now, here again, of course, I see a double meaning of this verse. Obviously, the, the, the first and obvious one is God's willingness to severely punish David's descendants, who reject him and his leadership. But number two, those who reject Jesus will face eternal punishment. Now, when you tell somebody that's lost that they are going to hell, they are going to a place separate from God for all eternity, oftentimes it comes across as harsh or callous. Some even would say that's unloving. However, as with David's descendants, we have been given the opportunity to accept God in his leadership or to reject God in his leadership. Rejection is our choice. And the punishment for rejection is separation from the one who wants a relationship with us. It's funny. We say, the lost people say, I don't want nothing to do with your God. Okay, well, you'll be separated from all eternity. Don't be upset with him when he gives you that punishment because it's your choice. You are choosing to be, you don't want anything to do with him now. You're not going to have anything to do with him for eternity. And that's going to be blackness and darkness, loneliness and pain and suffering. But it's your choice. Now think of it this way. He, talking about Jesus, has sent prophets, apostles, and disciples along with you and me mm -hmm. to tell everyone how much God loves them, how much he wants to be in, in their lives, how much he wants fellowship with them. Each one of us have to make a choice. If there was not a choice, then there would not be a reward. There could not be punishment. And since we have a real choice, then we have a real destiny. One of blessing, 
or one of curse. It's our choice, our, our choice. Then we'll get to verse 33. This is Roman numeral 9, if you keep it a hand out. This is God's promise of loyalty. Look what he says in verse 33. He's going back to David. First he said David, and then he said David's sons. Now he's going back to David. He says, nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him. I'm talking about David. Nor allow my faithfulness to fail David. I will never take my love away from David, and I will never stop being loyal to him. Now, did you hear that? My ears perk up when I hear God's going to be loyal to a man. That sounds a little curious to me. I'm like, wait, what, 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 what does that mean? Uh, I see a double meaning here. We're going to get to that. <laughs> double meaning first is we see it directed to David. Uh, next, we see it directed to us. And it's echoed in, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, and John chapter 14. For God himself said, I've already quoted it once, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I go to prepare a place for you. This is a reminder of God's loyal love to us, his faithfulness, his commitment, his loving kindness. That double meaning there for loving kindness also is God's faithfulness never allowed to fail. Which can be read that God will never stop being loyal to David. First, through David's obedience receiving blessings. <laughs> Here's the other part, number two. David's disobedience receiving punishment. We know that this shepherd boy disobeyed God. We know that he was punished severely for that. We know that David is a man after God's own heart, which in my understanding of that means that once he understood sin in his life, he owned up to it. He didn't try to pass it off to somebody else. He took ownership of it. And he took ownership of the punishment as well. Look at verse 34 as we get closer to the finishing tonight. It says, My covenant I will not break nor alter, or that means change, the words that I have that have gone out of my lips. In other words, God's saying, I'm not going to take back a single word that I've said to him, about him, for him. Now, this is strong language. It is to assure the readers, the singers, the hearers that God has settled on his commitment. That God will remain faithful even when people do not remain faithful. God is determined to complete, to fulfill, to accomplish his grand plan for David's dynasty. God wants to work in and through each of us to accomplish his grand plan in your life, in each of us. Roman 9 continues God's promise of loyalty. Look at verse 35, 6, 35, 36, and 37. Look what it says. Once I have sworn, that means to promise, by my holiness, God says, I will not lie to David. His seed, his family, his legacy, his dynasty shall endure forever. And his throne as the sun before me. That means to last as long as the sun. Here's a double, another double meaning with the word seed and forever as fulfilled through David's son, Solomon, but will be fulfilled forever through David's, uh, the son of David, a title that Matthew used to introduce Jesus, which identified Jesus' royal lineage. Finally, verse 37. It shall be established forever, like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. This will be fulfilled through Jesus in his second coming. And he, we will be with him, and he will establish his earthly kingdom, and then he will go over into his eternal kingdom forever and ever as far as the sky is for a man you can't see the end and it says about the moon we know eventually at the end of that thousand year uh, 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 there's a period of time where the earth and all around it is going to go through its judgment and when we get to that new Jerusalem on the new earth there's not going to be the need for the sun or the moon or the stars because Jesus will be its light to illuminate it it's coming what we see is God's promise of blessing, God's promise of correction, and God's promise of loyalty. He can be depended on, he can be counted on. And we want to make sure we remain in his time for all things that we do, that we desire to do for him, that we go after on behalf of him. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you. Once again, for all that you've done for us, what you've got in store for us, we do pray blessings upon us each individually as well as a collective here at Chambers of Baptist Churches. You are giving us direction on what you want us to do, not just in Chambersburg, not even in the state of Pennsylvania or the United States, but the whole entire world. We thank you that you want to use us to make a difference. So we go throughout this week, help us to look for people we can speak to, encourage, love on, on your behalf. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.